Well, guys, welcome for coming out to oh, microphone uh, Streaming Media West. Today we're going to talk about how big data can increase OTT ad revenue. We think it's, a, it's really an important time and an interesting time in the online media space because uh, things are changing. When more folks are using over-the-top television, how things are measured are changing this year. So yeah, we're really honored to have our, our panel members here. So just for us to get a sense of um, who's in the audience and the type of businesses you come from, just give me an idea. I mean, anyone can go. Give me an idea of the type of business you are, that you're coming from. Is it broadcasters? Is it studios, tech, uh, telcos, any, anyone? Yes, sir. Cable MSO. Cable MSO, perfect. Anyone else? Come on, son, you can't be used. Broadcast is perfect. Ah, perfect. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. CDN, okay. Broadcast products and services. Broadcast products and services, okay. Any ad agency folks here? Anyone that sells to ad, ad agencies? Broadcasters, of course. Okay. Got a good, uh, good idea, guys? Got so it. We've got a great panel here with us today. We've got technologists. We've got folks from the ad agency business that actually spend money on broadcasters, so that's a, that's a good thing. Um, platform manufacturers or technology companies, and also data scientists that take a look at all this data and predict habits and things. So we're going to start off with the intros. Um, I'm Steve Wong. I'm your moderator. I come from a company called Siemens. I have a background with ABC Broadcast, and you know, I write screenplays and make movies too. So. It's a little bit of both ends, and I started out actually in an agency, being a media buyer when I was uh, going through college and beating up broadcasters and doing yeah. projections, so I sort of relate to that. So if we can go, we're not sitting in order, but we'll just go sort of what we have here. Andy, you want to do an intro on yourself? Uh, sure. My name's Andy Beach. I'm a program manager at Microsoft. I work with a variety of the developers that are building the apps that folks are looking to monetize on. Right. Jason? Yeah. So I'm uh, president of Noble People LA. We're a media agency based in uh, New York and Los Angeles. I've uh, been on the uh, advertising and media side for about 15 years. Worked at Shia Day. I've worked at Widen and Kennedy. Uh, we've got a team of about 35 people, represent about 15 clients, doing anything from you know, small digital video buys up to Super Bowl buys this year. Wow. Expensive buys there at the Super Bowl, too. Val valuable buys. Valuable buys, that's right. Prospective buyers. Uh, Arnav, want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm, I'm Arnav. I'm a graduate student at University of Southern California, electrical engineer, and currently I'm working on a couple of data science and machine learning projects um, related to multimedia and advertisements. And Dr. Jay. Um, my name is Jay Yogeshwar. I am the director of uh, media entertainment and broadcast at Hitachi Data Systems. Uh, as they say, director of fun stuff. But uh, you know, Hitachi itself is a enterprise IT uh, company, and so we're sort of the arms dealer to uh, media companies. In a good way. <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, more importantly, I mean, we've seen a huge transition uh, from you know bespoke uh, appliances within the broadcast systems to uh, cloud-based and uh, analytics-based systems that are software-defined. So I'm uh, experiencing part of that transition. And I want to share with you some of the learnings on how we're trying to implement media analytics on um, the, the types of enterprise IT infrastructures. OK, thanks. You know, I, I think we hear a lot of things going on in the market about over-the-top television. And you know, is it a new way people consume media? And if so, how, how do we build businesses around that? You know, we'll, we'll take a look at some stuff here, some st statistics from the market. You know, one way is the Netflix model. People pay X amount per, money, uh, per month, and they get to watch all the movies they want. Netflix has a bunch of subscribers, multiplied by eight, that's your revenue stream. The other way is an ad-supported model, where someone watches something for free, sort of like broadcast television, and they have to, you know, we have to pay for that, so they have to watch ads. So the big question in the, in the market is, one, you know, is that model that we used to have when I was at ABC, a broadcast model that's supported by ad revenue, is that sustainable by over-the-top television? And if so, at what rates? You know, we used to call it you know, analog dollars for digital dimes. So the question is, what's happening? Is that a supportable model? 
So let's just jump down through some of the statistics here. So when we take a look at over the top television, we look at, at a world, you know, Siemens is a worldwide company. So when we look at, at the world, what's going on in OTT, we clearly see in North America is the way that's leading over the top television compared to the, the other regions. This is the most interesting point, and this is really the, the crux of what we're going to talk about today. We look at advertising, uh, over internet advertising, overtaking TV advertising. This is the first year that that really happened. So again, when we're thinking of cost per point delivery of broadcast TV versus internet television, this is where this balance starts to change, right? This is when over-the-top television business models that are ad-supported start to, to change and support themselves, which in the past never occurred. And again, we're going to get into this in a lot more detail. OTT app growth usage, you can take a look at what's happened in a sh very short period of time, 2014 to 2015, uh, the use of OTT for apps for delivering videos uh, or TV apps like ABC, HBO Go, CBS mobile app. Uh, a game shift has changed, especially with HBO and CBS going direct to consumers. So discussion points. Um, what are open platform for analytics? Because, you know, in the old days, we used to pull out, in the old, old days, Arbitron and Nielsen, we'd go and I'd go project a program, I'd give it to my sales guys and they'd go sell it. But what, today, what is that open platform for analytics? Um, what, what do you sure, guys see? Yeah. I mean, Steve, I could talk to that. Um, so um, today, uh, you, you still have a big need to, uh, to host your analytics on a platform because uh, quick time to insight is really the key to market agility. You want to be able to perform uh, data integration. You want to perform data discovery and predictive analytics um, very, very quickly on a platform that, uh, that saves you time, that uh, you do not have to go and manually figure out how to integrate your different components, how to batch ingest, how to stream ingest, and how to do all the real-time processing that's needed to go with the analytics. So um, essentially, if you're able to build a sort of a software-defined platform, that can provision, that can monitor, secure the media analytics, and uh, also do the troubleshooting, then you save the, the, the time frame to take an analytic idea, concept, and actually monetize it becomes much shorter. Mm -hmm. so, so the goal really is to build a platform that uh, any, any uh, ad agency, for example, can run their software on and uh, quickly gain very valuable insights. Yeah. So, so from an agency standpoint, Honda comes to you, say they're your client, they say, yeah. look, here's $2 million for our fourth quarter buy. Right. And you've got, of course, you've got Nielsen, right? Yeah. But you want to provide them more than the, the other agencies. What, what sort of analytics are you guys looking at? And there's not, there's not great analytics in the space right now, right? And so you look, I mean, there is, you know, you've got kind of Nielsen uh, on the television side. You've got folks like Comscore that sit on the digital side. And again, both of these are, are kind of sampling methodologies. I think when you get into OTT, if they're not participating meaningfully in some sort of, again, open third-party system like that, then you've got to really take their numbers on a face value. And so you're seeing a lot of that. I don't think there, there isn't kind of a one-stop shop for us to be able to go for metrics. You know, App Annie is another thing that we'll look at so we can understand kind of app downloads. But again, you're, just, you're grabbing metrics from kind of disparate sources, and they're all based on a different sampling methodology. So it's, e it's really hard to go, oh, that actually does equate to what Nielsen would call a point, right? That those are, are apples to apples. So that's the difficult piece of this, right? So, so your clients are coming to you, and they're, they want justification of where you spent that $2 million. What, what, what's the process with all the new technologies that you have at your fingertips? What's, what do you present to them? There's, I mean, there's a lot of different kind of tracking methodologies for video that we can use, right? But I think in terms of, I guess there's, there's two pieces of it. There's what data I'm going to use to plan to make decisions of where I'm going to buy. And then there's what data I'm going to use to, to say that that buy actually delivered. So in that sense, like Nielsen's got both of those things for us. I don't think you're seeing that, you know, there is no kind of industry standard platform like that stretching across OTT. Some people participate in some things, some people participate in other things. But that's, that's a super big challenge. So, so Andy, you're, you guys have access to tons of data, probably sure. more than we want to feel comfortable with. Um, so what's, what, what do you see out there? Well, so, yeah, right. So on, the, on like, uh, acquiring the data side, right, there's definitely like, the, I think it's not that they're, right, I think I agree that it's 
not that there's a uniform way of doing it, but there's right. tons of data. And right. so right now, because we're still evolving this, it's up to the company to sort of roll their own matrix for it. Mm -hmm. And so there are tools, you know, online uh, for, for doing some of that uh, on, you know, everybody's cloud platform of choices. Mm -hmm. uh, on the Microsoft side, there's things like <laughs> BI that basically just become giant dashboards. You can plug all the data into it that you want and start start quickly sort of pulling out analysis. Yeah. And, and so that's the way we're doing it now because there's not a way, there's not a way that anybody's identified as the, the way that everybody wants to do it moving forward. And I think it's probably another, you know, it's probably another four or five, maybe longer years before we consolidate down to a methodology that everybody can agree to. Yep. Um, in terms of like where we're taking that data though, I mean, I think particularly as we're, uh, as we look at like the, sort of the mobile usage side versus console or TV usage. Uh, we're getting tons of information, not only from uh, like how you, ac how you access it, but like who's actually watching it. Because you've, you've got sampling data from things like the cameras that are, that are in there that can be securely transferred in ways now. And so there's ways to parse that information so you not only know who, like what they're doing while they're watching it, you actually know who may be watching it. And that's data that can also be rolled into it. And I think that pushes that value price up even more. Yeah. Interesting. And, and Arnav, as a, as a data scientist, um, you see a lot of tools out there that, that may be in other industries. What, what do you, how do you see those tools from other industries being used in predicting what someone may watch or someone may buy? I, I, I completely agree with Andy that there, there's no standards for collecting and um, collecting the data, but um, there is no one good way to do it. But there are, there are a lot of bad ways to do it that if you do something and then it, your model doesn't work, it could be destructive to your business. Um, uh, as far as technology goes, there, there are, you could use um, social platforms, you could use Facebook, Twitter, APIs to get user in, uh, user's information. Um, you could scrape the, uh, uh, the uh, there, there's a company called GumGum Gum that visits uh, that, that uh, sees all the web pages that a user visits and using computer vision and image processing algorithms, they extract the information of the images that's on that pages. So there's, there's a lot of models that you can use to extract any kind of information, but how you use that, um, I, I, I know that Hitachi has a great open platform for learning that distributed computing and how you use all that information to make a meaningful decision for, for your business or uh, monetizing the content or delivering the advertisement. That's, that's what really matters. So, okay, to make everyone really nervous in the audience, if everyone opts in, so give us, I mean, can you really predict what someone's gonna buy? I mean, is there that much information out there, do you think, Arnav? Definitely, definitely. Wow. Um, like I said, there's, there's, it's a digital world, and there's a petabytes and terabytes of data just maybe relating to one person or like a group of person or a dem demographic of person. And the way you tap into that information um, really is all that matters. I actually met this company right now in the exhibits, Lift Igniter, and they are doing this in real time. And they're using all that um, cloud computing, AWS and uh, Scala and all these um, machine learning tools to um, actually do this in real time. And I think one of you, you guys may have heard of, uh, there's one a smart TV manufacturer, I forgot who it was, that was turning on cameras on the, on the smart TVs just to, I don't know how they were using it. I'm sure it was opted in to record folks if they were watching or not. Actually, Nielsen sort of did this too on, and it wasn't the people meter, it was something else just to determine you know, who's in the audience, is it an adult or non-adult. Yeah. So the technology is there. You know, how we use it for the good um, could help us justify higher costs, maybe? I don't know. For yeah, I mean, the, the costing is like a, a wide open issue, and there's so much that impacts cost. I mean, I think like there's, there's a rush in the advertising industry has been for probably four or five years to get really targeted with everything. Hmm. I think we're starting to see the backlash of that a little bit, because I think there are things like scale that still matter. I think what happened in digital display around programmatic and machine learning left a lot of people not as satisfied. Now, what do you general. mean by that? Give us an well, example. Well, I just think, you know, part of, part of in this rush to, I think, have data to justify a higher CPF. So say I'm looking for people who are in market for, to buy an automobile. That 
you know, the, the folks who supply that data and these third parties who are doing this analysis to identify those people that are in market are incentivized to make those pools as large as possible. Because at the end of the day, automakers still have to sell a lot of cars, right? So it's great to say like, oh, I'm absolutely sure one person's gonna buy a car, hmm. but I've gotta sell a million of those. And so I think there are a lot of people who exhibit characteristics, you know, within a, a given, you know, purchase pattern, if you will, and you can say that that's them. I don't think it represents the market. And a lot of this depends on product too. So what you'd have is you'd have data vendors who are saying, okay, well, I've, in, I've invented this algorithm to say these are, this is, these are people who are in market in auto and they're incentivized to make that pool as large as possible to then sell that back to say a Yahoo who is gonna sell it to me. And so a lot of that third party data and the kind of like, you know, sizing up of those databases, I think contributed to poor results, right? So then you start to see things where the premium that I paid for targeting those ads to automakers versus whether I had just blasted something out cheap, right? The premium I paid for targeting didn't, didn't actually, you know, pay out in the term. So it would have been cheaper for me just to have all the waste inherent in a mass buy. It's almost like the old model of direct, you know, mail versus a broadcast buy. Yeah, I mean, there's the same kind of targeting, like we've seen, we've done these experiments in direct mail, we've done it really in any medium. Um, is, it, is that premium of targeting actually worth it in terms of what your business result's gonna be? And I think a, a lot of that depends on the product. I think it's really different for Rolex than it is for mac and cheese. A lot of people buy mac and cheese. I yeah. need predictive behavior to know who's gonna buy mac and cheese. Like, it's pretty much almost everyone in America, so I'm gonna focus yeah. on different kinds of buys. So, I think a lot of it depends on the product that you're in. You know, travel's like a really interesting space, right? Because there's time elements, so I have a rental car client, so data becomes really valuable around, I know someone booked an airline ticket within a week. Like, I think there are scenarios you get into that you go, okay, that is actually valuable data, and then you find the buyer, you know, if you're a seller of that media inventory or that data, and then you find the kind of right buyer for that. But I don't think it's, you know, I don't think the answer is, Everything's it's not overall across the board. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So, with Google open source uh, TensorFlow libraries for machine learning, how would it affect the industry? I mean, what do you guys think? Um, uh, I have a problem with this. That this this it's kind of every two years or every few years, someone comes out with a new library or some new technology and everyone's running towards that. It started in 1990s with support vector machines and then it moved on to neural networks and then it moved on to artificial intelligence and then a lot of machine learning with, with distributed co computing, machine learning training models came in and we're back on machine learning. So there's, there's like, like we've been discussing, there's no real standard that we can use to make models and deliver advertisements uh, or targeted advertisements. So it's really cute that Google uh, released their tensor, uh, this TensorFlow and um, I, I did check it out and it's um, open source so we'll, we'll see how that goes with um, how, how the engineers use it and if it would be successful. It's been successful for Google but how uh, now that they have open sourced it, how successful it would be in, for, for other people. Any other comments? Well, um, I think you know, technology such as TensorFlow uh, or machine learning and uh, content analytics, uh, as they said, they, they've, have, they've been around in a cyclical way and available, but very few have been actually able to exploit these things. Uh, one great example is, you know, I think, digital smiths that, that managed to um, really focus in on the commercial aspect of um, content analytics, and uh, I think that a few years ago they got bought by TiVo, mm -hmm. and they used it for a very, very specific purpose of uh, recommendation engines um, and content personalization. So I think uh, as long as you have a very specific uh, area in mind and you're able to apply that in a uh, clever way, then you can be successful. Otherwise, it's just another tool in your toolbox. There's no one tool for everything, right? Absolutely. Interesting. And again, it comes back to standards, right? I mean, where do these standards, you know, how do you create these? Who, who, what is the organization that's going to create these standards, right? Yep. So with data, with data science technology changing every three years, what new language should a company select? If we're putting together an OTT system and we want to have uh, data science tied with it? What do you guys think? Do you select one or? 
Well, there are plenty of options. You could do Python, which is, again, open source. It has a lot of uh, libraries that are that many data science companies are using. That's scikit-learn, which is machine learning library. Then there's standard scientific Python and uh, SciPy and NumPy, which is scientific and numerical Python libraries. Um, there's ten TensorFlow now that Google has released it. And then a lot of um, natural language processing uh, work is done in Scala. And, um, and, and of course, you can do it. To make that real time, you have a lot of data. You can use distributed com computed, uh, computing system like Hadoop. And if you want it, maybe you can, want, uh, you can have it on your own servers, or you can do it on cloud, um, on AWS, or any, any cloud service. So it's completely uh, autonomous, like as in what do you want? How much do you want to spend on this? Um, you can like cherry pick your options, which language to use. You, uh, whether or not to use distributed computing, whether you want it on uh, uh, real time or not. So it's, it's really how much budget you have and how much you are willing to spend on this. So Randy, what do you think? Well, I know you have an opinion. <laughs> so. uh, I was, I was going to mention Azure. If, if you haven't uh, looked at the yeah, of course. machine learning on Azure, Azure. Uh, yeah. maybe, uh, maybe check that out. I, I'm uh, actually uh, doing a course, a uh, Microsoft course on Azure. It's on edX. Excellent. Yep. Uh, so yeah, the machine learning has been a definitely been a big area uh, in the on the Azure platform uh, over the last year. Um, uh, refining uh, using uh, particularly around how they can start using some of those capabilities uh, and tie it into. I don't know if you've looked into uh, this is not strictly in the data science realm of it, but uh, using some of those same algorithms to create something called Project Oxford, uh, which is out there now which starts pulling in things like the ability to, uh, to transcribe the, uh, the text contextually, so based on you know, all of the information you're getting, making decisions around, uh, around um, uh, the words and what they mean uh, so that you've got more accurate uh, uh, items to search, uh, but also some image processing, so being able to detect not only whether there are people in the, in the shot, but also like the sentiment uh, of the people that are in the shot, uh, things like that. So, so being able to sort of pull in and make uh, sort of calculated decisions around that uh, has been, it's been pretty interesting to watch how rapidly it's evolved. Mm -hmm. uh, because even, it was pretty cool like a year ago when I started first playing with, with some of it and the, the more people who use it, the, the more refined all of those uh, programs become and the more accurate they all become. It's, it's all that stuff that, you know, they kind of made a splash with it like a year ago, I guess my age. Yeah. And, you know, it was really bad when it first started because it was like, basically if you had a beard, it added 15 years to your, to your age. And uh, it's actually gotten uh, much better at, that, at, that, uh, at those capabilities now. And that's really just kind of scratching the surface of, of what you can do with, with some of that. But, but a lot of this stuff, you know, although it's new to the, the media, it's not new to uh, medical science, it's not new to the securities, I'm not in my division, but Siemens has, you know, software that helps protect nations. Um, again, not in my division. So the technology is there, right? Right. Uh, so, I mean, from an infrastructure hardware company, I can say that, you know, we, we do have to support all kinds of open source uh, on our, our platforms. Um, so whether that's Hadoop or, you know, uh, any other open stack uh, type of technologies, well, we, we have to make sure that they run on our platforms without any changes. So, so we natively support open stack APIs, for example, um, to be able to run uh, NoSQL or Hadoop or those kinds of uh, processing. So I remember, again, way back when I was at an agency, when we used to do stuff, or besides in Nielsen, yeah. we'd use, you know, Birch or some other things, or we'd have, you know, in-house, like when we were looking for talent, we'd bring about 10 people in a room, we'd say, run some tapes and say, oh, what do you think of this news anchor versus this news anchor? You know, which one do you like better? And, and that's how we'd hire it, you know, a small sample, or we'd subscribe to another service that would go out in the market and do a survey, of course, it would never be real time, you'd buy, it, you know, by the year or the quarter, or whatever. Mm -hmm. What do you see out there? Who, when, when guys are coming to, to sell you this new technology, what, what do you see that's different than when I was in the agency business like 400 years ago? 
Not a whole lot. Wow, I mean, really? Yeah, I mean, when you really strip it, strip it down. I mean, I think we'll talk about that stuff. There's, there's an incredible amount to measure. I think Andy said it. Like, it's, it's. There's almost too much data. So there's always, mm. you know, there's still sales guys. So you know, they're gonna, they're gonna pick the best data that they have. Yeah. So you know, I, we don't get to, you know, ter like, uh, uh, terribly often exposed to, you know, what languages, you know, we're building these sorts of things in. Uh, you know, I built a copy testing tool and used some Python stuff, but it's not machine learning or, you know, any of those sorts of things. So we a little bit of exposure to that. But, you know, a lot of this work's still done in Excel. Like, it still needs to be able to fit on a keynote slide. I still need to be able to get a CMO to understand it in about 45 seconds. Um, so belaboring this thing and, you know, trying to do multiple pivots isn't, isn't going to work for our business. Like, we've still got to get it down to some common metrics. And I think that's when we talk about these data platforms, it's like definitions, I think, are the biggest piece in our business. Because if we have all clear definitions of what it actually means when somebody's viewing it, like is that one person in the room, is that two person in the room, is that somebody went to the bathroom, is that it just started to play on Facebook, is that, you know, what are those definitions? And I think it makes our job easier because we can, we can do those like apples to apples comparisons in Excel. Interesting. So w when your clients are coming to you, the vice president of marketing, the chief marketing officer at you know, a car company or an airlines. Yep. How sophisticated are these guys? What, what do they expect? I mean, their kids have iPads. They've got the phones and yeah. they're seeing things. I mean, what, what are they I mean, asking? I think they're you? remarkably sophisticated about their business, right? And so they've hired, you know, they've hired whether it's consultants or have in-house, you know, analysts to do, you know, really robust segmentations and, and all these sorts of things. So I think they're really, really wise to that. But I don't think, you know, a, a, they could explain the difference between Hadoop and, you know, Azure. They just want to know the number. <laughs> Hadoop's on Azure. Right. So the, so the, that makes the same. Right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a different level of sophistication. And it's a different area of focus, you know. But I think it's everyone's trying to, trying to understand what this means and what it means to their business and try to get some common definitions and these sorts of things. I think everyone's certainly sophisticated enough at, at this point to not just chase data for data's sake, right, to really start to kind of peel that back. And I think, you know, digital media has had a lot to do with that. In terms of, you know, there's plenty of, plenty of hucksterism and the things that were sold in, in early days of digital media that I think have made everyone in the marketing industry just aware of that. I need to know the definition on that. I need to know the source of that. I need to know the scale of that, you know, those sorts of things. So. Interesting. Interesting. So what are open platform analytics? What, what do you guys, how do you define what that is? Uh, there, there, oh, sorry. Good. Uh, after you hit 50 things, you know, <laughs> repeat. Um, so the ROI, how's that been affected by companies using data science and trying to monetize their content? You know, trying to sell the guys like this. How do, how do they get a higher rate? What, what do you guys see out there? Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so uh, I, I guess uh, from a media perspective or a content uh, owner perspective, you know, uh, the, there's two areas that you want to improve uh, in, in terms of the quality of experience of your viewers. Um, one is, you know, how do you uh, optimize your content so that it can be discovered? And then the second is how do you personalize the content so you combine the discovery with the user behavior and, uh, and you do, you know, targeted content. Um, so you could sell more premium content to that person or SVOD or sell through. So, uh, you know, just as ROI is measured today in terms of uh, ARPU, uh, in terms of um, churn rate? I mean, are you, uh, are you reducing the amount of churn? Uh, are you getting more per user? I think those uh, me metrics still count today in terms of ROI. If your analytics process can improve the quality of experience or the quality of service that directly results in reduced churn, I think uh, you've got your investment return. Andy, I mean, you're, you're deeply involved with this. What do you, what do you see? Uh, I think it was interesting uh, that you talked about discoverability because I think that's that's sort of the and that came up in our last panel, Steve. That where right. that's such a big part of this is like getting the not only finding the data but then finding ways to surface to the user is like the big open challenge in digital media now. Like we all knew how it worked in in television. Like yeah. you know, that's Flip a the very channel, known, right? simple, right? It's like a super easy like quantity and and it's so easy to get lost right now in that fragmentation as we have all the different screens all the different devices all the different apps in those devices so that which is causing all of that data that we're trying to get but but surfacing surfacing it back or finding the ways to to apply that back to the end user so that they're getting the things that they want it's like the big challenge in the area right now so what do you see do you think that's more of a recommendation engine andy or do you think that's 
uh, it, learning about that viewer? What, or yeah, is it a marketing thing? It's definitely, I mean, recommendation is part of it. And then there's, it, it's almost like, a, you know, I wish, I wish I had the money to go just do a startup right now with this, because I think this well, is like could. the hot I think area. we've got some VCs right? in the room. That's so. right. Uh, but it, it's, it's sort of part recommendation, part curation. Uh, and, and then it's the model, right? There's a, like, there's, you've got to almost be flexible enough in the, in the way you're presenting it, it's because there are going to be some people that are totally happy to have it as supported. You, then you've got to cater to the people who are perfectly happy to pay extra and do away with the ads. You know, but Hulu right now I think is probably doing it extremely well, and hopefully that their uh, their new tier of service is, has uh, proven to be profitable for them. Uh, but I think it's it's getting positive results, and I think it's probably helping with their subscriber base too. I think it's going to be almost a combination, right? Yeah, Where it's, can't, it's not you, one. You or can't the have other. one or it's, the other. Right? It's a balance. And I think the balance is constantly changing, and you've got to you got to be flexible enough to sort of meet the needs of that and and move because it's gonna it's gonna sort of swing back and forth, right? You're gonna go through heavy subscriber periods, mm -hmm. then that's gonna drop off, and you've got to be ready to meet with the the advers advertising side of that to compensate for it. Mm -hmm. So it's a balancing act. Interesting. So from an agency side, I just want to get your perspective. Would your guys rather have a pre-roll? of a show, or would they rather be product placed in that show? A little bit off subject, but still, yeah, it's, it's marketing dollars, right? Yeah, I think it really depends on, on what you're trying to do. I know that's like a generic answer, but yeah. um, you know, certain things are best treated when I need to explain it, right? I, I need that 30 seconds to be able to kind of take you on a journey. Other things are, hey, I just need to have this brand visible in your life, and we're playing a repetition game. Mm -hmm. you know, you're going to buy insurance every five years, but Geico's on top of you constantly. Right, so that when you make that decision, they're top of mind. So it's just where, where the brand is at. I think in general, like all advertisers want to feel like they're in more premium places and they're in bigger places. Yeah. So it's also going to depend on the nuance of how you're integrated into that show. Right? If you become you know, co-star of that show, then that's really different. Like the old uh, soap operas, right? It would yeah. be that, uh, yeah. that manufacturer. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. But it's interesting to me, like just this, the talking about ROI, that is, it's focused on like discovery and recommendation, which is like antithetical to the conversation, right? Because you're saying like, well, how is big, big data going to increase ad revenue? How is it going to increase cost per point? The, the unit price of, by which I'm selling advertising, but then the ROI conversation is like, how am I going to get more people watching? Which is just, that's, that's the classic advertising metric, right? It is just eyeballs in and of itself. And I think that's, that's the hurdle we need to cross first before we start getting into, well, we're going to triple the price on the CPM. You're, you're going to have to go a long way on the CPM to make up for the delta between right. you know, the cost model of cable mm -hmm. and the cost model of Netflix. Right? So I don't know if the CPM's ever going to really cut that. Interesting. It's a huge, it's a huge delta. So you just yeah. scales need more, more eyeballs. More eyeballs solves it, I think, is easier, certainly, than more targeting. So the question is, are those yeah. eyeballs equal? Wait, when you see yeah. an eyeball, yeah. not see an eyeball, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah advertisingly see yeah. an eyeball on broadcast television, see an eyeball on cable, or see an eyeball on something like a Netflix if they accepted advertising. Is that equal to you as a buyer of advertising? No, I mean, there's, there's certainly demographic differences in those audiences. Um, there's, there is this kind of squishy equation of context, right? And so like, there's things like late night, like late night be, might be really great and it works, but like there's certain brands who are like, I'm not going to be in late night TV. Like it's, a, it's just, it, it's going to erode at the premiumness of my brand. So there's a lot of nuance to those decisions. But if the time frame, if we can say these are equal time yeah, frames. Time frame, demographic, kind of all the same. It's, it's a tough question. I, I want to say yes, although I could imagine there'd be scenarios where you'd say no, but I'd say more often, yeah, it's spot. Like, and, and I think, you know, we're doing a lot of experiments where we're, doing you know, digital video buys against television buys, right? To really say, like, these, like are you know, these actually similar? You know, if you measure them the same, they're the exact same weights, and these sorts of things, like, can you accomplish? And I run digital video in one city, and I run television in another city. Like, what, what does that look like? And so I think we're trying to move in that direction. But besides, if we take the numbers out of it, which yeah. it's tough because it's a numbers game, right? right? I mean, in the mindset of a, a media buyer, yeah. The, do they see, well, network television, yeah, that's more eloquent, so I'll willingly to pay more, as yeah. opposed to someone on an iPhone. You know, is, does that come into play at all, or is it just a really pure numbers game? 
I think it's a pure numbers game. I, I, and, Interesting. You know, I, again, as much as it's like, you know that that's a real person, that you know that yeah. that's how they consume media, that they actually are paying attention to their iPhone, and I think, yeah, I think it's, I mean, that's a shift in, in this business. I think there definitely was like a, a, an older predisposition to like, no, oh, it's got to feel big, and we, you know, we got to be on network. Well, yeah, ratings are, aren't there on network. So, it's the time you're pulling together a cable buy anyway. So, I think like that was the first thing to go, like the stigma of cable. Right, and then now you're saying like, well, the digital video, like, no, digital video is be just as premium as anything else. This, you know, OTT inventory that I'm buying is just as premium as anything else. So, so yeah, in that sense, the eyeball is kind of the eyeball, 95 percent. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, content discovery can actually lead to more eyeballs. And right. And there's a couple of success stories out of Europe, uh, both Orange and the uh, Portuguese uh, Zon. Um, it's a multi-screen service that they introduced called Iris. So what they did was they targeted uh, social interaction. So your friends would recommend a certain program that they uh. saw and they liked. And so you would never have seen that program if, unless uh, if it was uh, your friend that saw it and recommend that uh, to you. Um, so as a result of that, they were able to get more eyeballs and, and actually uh, pretty successful in getting more revenue out of, out of the same content that they had previously distributed through the cable service. Right. Hmm. So through the multi-screen service, they were able to monetize it better. Interesting. Interesting. I gotta tell you, I remember when I was with ABC back, back in the 90s, right? I took our 5 p.m. news and I streamed it live through See You, See Me. It was like yeah. you know, a million years ago. Yeah. I think five people saw it. And then I got a note from my, my GM at the station. He said, stop wasting your time with the internet. It's, it's a fad. Right. So obviously not a yeah. fad anymore. <laughs> He, he's retired with a ton of, in those days, Cap City stocks. So he, he's <laughs> yeah. so happy. Oh, wow. Um, got a few minutes left, but so what are the various functional components? Uh, uh, what is the end result of the output? Oh, well, I think uh, in the end, um, I, I'd like to put the analytics into you know, three buckets. How does it improve the quality of service associated with your say, OTT offering, for example? Mm -hmm. um, because you know, the better the service, uh, less buffering and, and less of the jitter and those kinds of issues, then, then of course, people are going to stick longer um, and the quality, of course. And so the quality of services is key. Um, so if analytics improves that, I think you've uh, gone a long way. Uh, quality of experience, which I earlier mentioned about content optimization, content personalization. And then finally, it's about uh, content monetization through ad analytics. So, so really, that is the end result. Uh, of anything that you do, I mean, if you're not able to improve those three buckets, uh, then all the data science and data analytics that you've done uh, has not been of much effect. Makes sense. And I think you said also, for you to take action on it, to, to hand to your clients, you have to have something usable that they can understand and measurable. Yeah, yeah, measurable. And, and I think, you know, as much as possible from a third party. Right? I mean, I think so much of our business is transacted off of those third-party numbers and like, this is a space where there's not a lot of them. And so that's stopping the flow of dollars into this space in a really big way. Well, um, that's a quite, I mean, if, if you're getting these numbers from the guy that's playing the video, is right. that less credible from you than a third party that's providing this information? I think it's the question of whether I'm going to get it. That's where I go back into like the question of what I'm going to buy versus yeah. how I'm going to measure it. So yeah, like I can gather data out of any integration that I'm doing inside of an app and I know that this thing's pinged my server X number of times and so that must mean that X number of people or pings were there, right? Depending on what it is. Um, so, so yeah, I think you can get that, but it's, you know, no one wants to be the guy that recommends a thing that fails. So yeah. if, if the sales guy's telling me like, oh, we're gonna have one million views and that's based on his own data or some cut of a data that I'm not seeing, and we get into the thing and it's got 100,000 views, it's still the best performing thing ever, but I look like an idiot. So, you know, it's I think that's, goods, that's right? where the third party thing needs to come in. It's, it's that upfront and opening the door to those conversations. That less so like, is it measurable on the back end? Because I think we're really good. I mean, there's simple, we've been using simple regression analysis in TV and radio for a really long time. So there's just yeah. time-based regression models. We don't have to get super fancy to know that something must have happened, right? We're seeing more sales, and so you can yeah. attribute that. And <laughs> is it perfect? No, but advertising kind of never was anyways. And yeah. so, so it's okay. But I think it's that opening the door and starting a conversation and be like, this is something I should look at. Because I think media, media buyers are then, you know, just predisposed to look at, like, what are the biggest apps? Like, what are the biggest things that I yeah. can do? And, and maybe miss some opportunities where, 
Like, I think the podcast space is really interesting right now, like what they're doing in advertising, like accepting one advertiser, getting really, that, that advertiser really integrating in a show, and I'm like, the advertisers that I see doing podcasts are really loving it. But it feels undiscovered, and it's another space where like there's not really good metrics. Like you got pod track kind of trying to figure that out. And so like we need a little maybe a, a pod track in this space. Or I know Nielsen was maybe going to be involved in this or not. But maybe it's good. But like maybe they should do that. Maybe. Think Interesting. Hmm. <laughs> so. Andy. Uh, yeah, I totally agree about the uh, on the podcasting side. Like it's sort of this like like greenfield space that you know. It, like it did exist, it was radio, basically, right, right. And, and but now it's not. Uh, but it, it it is where there's like some really interesting um, experiments in the way in the advertising model that's going on, and it would be great to sort of see that make a jump back into back more in traditional video. Yeah. Uh, OTT. Totally. Yep. Cool. Yeah, enough. Just quickly summarizing all uh, three quick points that any OTT service needs to do is one get consumers. Um, make users sign up for your service, retain them. Um, that, that's completely subjective that because, because it depends on the quality of content that you stream. And then if you want to go down that road, advertisements. And for all these three things, uh, data science can help. So hire more engineers, hire more data, data scientists. We are good at what we do. Especially from <laughs> USC, right? Yeah. yeah. So we've got about five minutes left. I want to open it up uh, to questions. And I'm going to repeat the questions so we can record it. Yes, sir. For each of you, if you were to mentor and advise somebody new to the space, a broadcaster, pay TV operator, PR, agency, whatever, and you were to want to tell them the number one lesson that they should practice as they get into the data analytics space in media, entertainment, and telecom, what would that number one lesson be? So let me repeat that, guys. So the question is, if you were to mentor someone getting into the data analysis space with big data, and you were to advise them, what, what would that advice be? You want to start it down the line, Jay? Um, sure. So, so I think data analytics or data science has got a lot of promise. But uh, the, the very first step is you want to make sure that uh, the data that you get is clean, um, that uh, it's been called, and that you're not uh, you know, dealing with noise or spurious information. So, so, th so that's very important just to get started. Um, and then th there is, uh, there's a lot of ways in which um, th th steps in between to go from collecting that data to actual monetization. Um, so I would suggest you know, have the end goal in mind first before you start to process your data. Makes sense. Beware of spurious correlations. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Not bad data. I remember like in er early, early days of Facebook, uh, they came out of a study with Starbucks, and it was about uh, uh, the people who like Starbucks on Facebook buy more coffee at Starbucks. And it was kind of presented as a thing of like that was a result of them liking Starbucks on Facebook. But in, re in reality, it was like completely the other way around. So it was like people who buy a lot of Starbucks also take the time to like Starbucks on Facebook. So just, just be really cautious, I think, when you're talking to, if you're, especially if you're selling media, like what, what kind of conclusions you're drawing from the data you're looking at. Interesting. Andy? Uh, definitely start with an assumption and then be ready to be wrong. Like, it, like no, don't, don't let the data pile up. Don't keep shaping the data to prove that you're right. Uh, like, find, have an assumption, start, to, start uh, looking into it, and then if you're, if you're wrong, be ready to make a change. People behave strangely. Yeah. Right? Exactly. <laughs> Arnav? I'll just, I'll just, I completely agree with Andy. I, I read this somewhere that the best time to apply machine learning to your product was five years ago or right now. <laughs> so it's, it's really an experimental field, and um, there are a lot of things that can go wrong and do go wrong. So yeah, but we got to keep trying. Makes sense. Any questions from the audience? Um, uh, and repetition OK, let me uh, summarize again. Um, I feel like a translator here. Um, so again, we've got tons of information about what people like and, and uh, what they may buy. So how far away are we of actually sending relevant, important ads to someone and not repeating it? I got to say, when I was at the station placing our own promotional ads, I annoyed the hell out of folks because I would repeat our promos for 5 and 10 PM news intentionally. Yeah. We got higher ratings, but um, Well, Jake? from a manufacturer point of view, I can say that content analytics have come a long way. So you can actually get very, very good detailed semantic descriptions of uh, scenes 
and, uh, and the content. Um, so now the question is, you know, how do you apply ad placement technology to, uh, to the metadata that's been collected about the content? Um, so I think that's up to folks like you to uh, figure out and, and see if that's going to be appropriate or if it's going to be backlash from the consumers. Yeah. I think it's just an economic question of how much is the waste worth or not worth, like the value of that waste, right? I, I don't envision a utopia where I think everyone's going to love every ad, because even an ad that's perfectly targeted could just be a really shitty ad. So it's still going to annoy people. So like it, it's less of a problem I think we're trying to solve, you know? So machine learning won't fix a shitty ad. Yeah, no. No, no, no. <laughs> it actually makes them worse. Right, um, right. <laughs> Teaches them how to be more. Right, yeah. right. Uh, yeah, I think the I think it, just even as a viewer of OTT stuff, the the like lack of, of um, variety of ads becomes the like the harbinger of like like that's the part I'm also waiting on is like we we just need people spending more money in the space so that there's a, a wider variety of them because okay. I can't see the same Travelocity ad six more times. Yeah. Arnav. Yeah. Uh, speaking from mathematical point of view, um, there are a lot of things there. Are hundreds and thousands of models that you can train and apply. So that you could use logistic regressions, you could use maybe clustering, which is maybe less uh, uh, compute exhaustive. But um, it really depends on how good, how much data that you have. Uh, uh, even like 10,000 samples might not be good enough to deliver deep perfect content or deep perfect advertisement that it might repeat or it might, may not repeat. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on how good your model is and how much data you have uh, to deliver a, per, a perfect uh, advertisement. Great. Guys, we're a minute over. So I want to thank you very much for coming out. Our panelists are going to be out in the hallway to, to answer any of your questions. And thank you so much, uh, folks, for coming out. I think we had a great uh, diversified panel. So again, thank uh, our panelists. Thank you. thank you very much. <laughs>